Let us now turn together to 1 Kings uh, chapter 22. And I will actually start the reading from verse 1. 1 Kings 22, and we start from verse 1. Now, just before we start reading, uh, just a little bit of uh, geography here. Uh, we know that Israel, where Ahab was king around 850 BC, Israel was the northern kingdom, Judah was the southern kingdom. But then there was another nation northeast of Israel, which was Syria, also often called Aram. But in these days of our text, there was a city across the Jordan, today it will be in Jordania, a city called Ramoth Gilead. And that's a city that belonged to the northern kingdom, but at this stage in history, Syria or Aram in the north still held the rule over it. And that's what the fight is all about in our text. But as we read our text, let us focus on the condition why God's prophet Micaiah would be set free from the prison. There's a condition, something needed to happen for Micaiah to be set free. And what is that something? So we start then at verse 1. Three years passed without war between Aram and Israel. In the third year, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. Now the king of Israel said to his servants, Do you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us? And we are still doing nothing to take it out of the hand of the king of Aram. And he said to Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to battle at Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are. My people are your people. My horses as your horses. Moreover, Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, Please inquire first for the word of the Lord. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men. Now these prophets were, uh, by the context of our text, they were not God's prophets. They were pagan prophets. But he gathered 400 men and said to them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle? Or shall I refrain? And they said, Go up, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not yet a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. He is Micaiah, son of Imlah. But Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Bring quickly Micaiah, son of Imlah. Now the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, were sitting each on his throne, arrayed in their robes at the threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets were prophesying before them. I think it was a chaos there. Then Zedekiah, the son of Canana, made horns, so that's animal horns, out of iron for himself, and said, Thus says the Lord, with these you will gore the Arameans until they are consumed. All the prophets were prophesying thus, saying up 
Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. Then the messenger who went to summon Micaiah spoke to him, saying, Behold now the words of the prophets are uniformly favorable to the king. Please let your word be like the word of one of them and speak favorably. But Micaiah said, As the Lord lives, what the Lord says to me, that I will speak. When he came to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, Shall we go to Ram of Gilead to battle, or shall we refrain? And now Micaiah is going to first uh, try and, we would say, take the mickey out of him. And Micaiah answered him, Go up and succeed, and the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. Then the king said to him, How many times must I adjure you to speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? So he said, and that's Micaiah saying, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains like sheep which have no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let each of them return to his house in peace. Then the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? Micaiah said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right and on his left. The Lord said, Who will entice Ahab to go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said this, while another said that. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. The Lord said to him, How? And he said, I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Then God said, You are to entice him and also prevail. Go and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all these your prophets. And the Lord has proclaimed disaster against you. Then Zedekiah, the son of Kanaa, that's the prophet that was last speaking, came near And he struck Micaiah on the cheek and said, How did the Spirit of the Lord pass from me to speak to you? Micaiah said, Behold, you shall see on that day when you enter an inner room to hide yourself. Then the king of Israel said, So that's Ahab speaking. Take Micaiah and return him to Amon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, Thus says the king, Put this man in prison and feed him sparingly with bread and water until I return safely. See the condition, my brother and sister? Micaiah is going to sit in that prison until I have the king comes home safely. Micaiah said, If you indeed return safely, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, Listen all you people. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat king of Judah went up against Ramoth Gilead. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go into the battle. But you... King of Judah, put on your robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself, and he went into the battle. Now the king of Aram had commanded the 32 captains of his chariots, saying, Do not fight with small or great, but with the king of Israel, with Ahab alone. 
So when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, they said, surely it is the king of Israel. And they turned aside to fight against him. And Jehoshaphat cried out. When the captains of the chariot saw it was not the king of Israel, it was not Ahab, they turned back from pursuing him. Now a certain man drew his bow at random and struck the king of Israel in a joint of the armor. So he said to the driver of his chariot, and that's Ahab now that has been wounded, Turn around and take me out of the fight, for I am severely wounded. The battle raged that day, and the king was propped up in his chariot in front of the Arameans and died at evening. And the blood from the wound ran into the bottom of the chariot. Then a cry passed throughout the army close to sunset, saying, Every man to his city and every man to his country. So the king died and was brought to Samaria. And they buried the king in Samaria. They washed the chariot by the pool of Samaria. And the dogs licked up his blood. Now the harlots bathed themselves there according to the word of the Lord which he spoke. And then it just says the rest of the acts of Ahab and all that he did and the ivory house which he built and all the cities which he built, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Ahab slept with his fathers and Ahaziah, his son, became king in his place. Thus far the reading of God's word. And then I would also like to read with you, my brother and sister, and you may not have this booklet due to the restrictions, um, from page 107 to small pieces from the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 5. And it's all about God's providence, how God steers all events. And we've just seen in God's Word how He steered an event where King Ahab thought, I will disguise myself. I will not put on king's clothes so they will not get me. And yet they got him because God is at the steer of things. And so we read in the Westminster uh, chapter 5, paragraph 2, although in relation to the foreknowledge and decree of God, who is the first cause, all things come to pass unchangeably and infallibly. Yet by the same providence, he orders them to occur according to the nature of second causes, either necessarily or freely or contingently. And then paragraph 3. In his ordinary providence, God makes use of means. Yet he is free to work without or above or against them as he pleases. Thus far, the reading from the Westminster. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, the previous paragraph of the Westminster Confession, Article 5, Paragraph 1, reminded us that God governs and steers all things. It says that God governs and steers all things. But the articles that we are in, uh, studying today explains how God governs and steers all things. And the sermon has three points, and here is the first one. God is the first cause. My brother and sister, next door to where Annette and I live, the owner there is building three new houses in his backyard. Well, already at the very first stage of his building activities, he was told he could no longer proceed as he had planned, as the plans were drawn up. Why? 
Well, because according to the new flood laws of the city council, he first had to raise the ground level of his backyard by at least 80 centimeters, by nearly one meter. So what a costly surprise that was to our neighbor. But here's the point I want to make. Before builders can start building, an architect must first draw up the plans. However, when it then comes to, to building that plan, it seems that quite frequently it so happens that the building supervisor on site does not or can no longer follow every detail given by the architect. So that's what human beings do, not always following what was planned. But that's not how God works. You see, in God's world, He is both the architect that planned and the supervisor. And no detail will be changed as His plan is executed. Look, is that not why Ephesians 1 verse 11 says that God works all things according to the counsel of His will? Yes, although God is not the author of evil, yet even the bad things in this world happen exactly as He has decreed. Yes, even the, the shocking killing of God's Son happened exactly as God has decreed. That's why Peter was able to say to the crowd on Pentecost Day that they crucified and killed Jesus Christ, but according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, Acts 2, verse 23. And thus, even though human beings are causing many events on this earth to happen, yet God remains the first cause. The first cause behind every human action. And so we talk then of God as the first cause behind every human action, and we talk of every human being's action as the second cause. It's not just behind every human action that God is the first cause. No, God is the first cause behind all things happening. Indeed, you see, so easily we talk of the power of gravity, which prevents us from falling off the earth. Likewise, we so easily talk of the centrifugal force of the sun, which keeps the earth and all other planets going nicely around it. And yes, we talk of the centripetal force, which the earth exercises on you and me as it turns around its own axle. And so you and I talk of these forces as if they are the first causes of the actions which hold you and me nicely on this planet. But what does the Bible say? Who is the first cause behind all even these forces of nature? It is God. Thus God is the first cause behind every event whether it be events caused by human actions or events caused by the forces of nature, like gravity or earthquakes or weather patterns, and behind every action of every animal, bird, fish, or insect. That is why the Westminster 5.2 has summed it up so well by saying, by the foreknowledge and decree of God, who is the first cause, all things come to pass 
unchangeably and infallibly. Well, so far regarding point one, God is the first cause. Here is point two. God steers second causes. So one could say God steers your and my actions. My brother and sister, God needs no one else to help him execute his every decree or plan. He does not need us. He could have decided to perform every thought, every action and event, just all by himself. Yes, God could have decided to bypass our human wills so that we had no decision-making to do ourselves. But that, would have, but that would have been much, but then we would have been much like robots whose every move is steered by the operator. My brother and sister, if God had not created our first parents with a capacity to freely choose their actions, how would it then have become known that their obedience to his fruit-eating command was not merely a cold, computerized act, but an obedience that came from hearts that were moved, hearts that were stirred to love their maker with their will. <clears throat> See why God created our first parents were the capacity of free choosing. And so God uses second causes, like human beings, with their wills that can choose. He uses animals with their own minds. And the forces of nature with their own cycles. Thus, what has so often been said is so true. God could have spread the gospel all by himself. But he has chosen frail human beings like you and me to do that. God could all by himself have worked repentance in the heart of your son and your daughter. But for his own reasons, he decided to use your and my prayers for that. Indeed, from eternity past, God has also decreed all our prayers to happen. No wonder God's word urges us to be devoted to prayer, to be faithful in prayer. So in the execution of his will, God, who is the first cause, uses second causes and here is the mind-bending miracle. And that is that without violating the human will, God works all human actions, but in such a way that God is not to be blamed for human sinful actions, nor that human beings are absolved from guilt for their sinful actions. In this regard, let us remember a very easy verse to remember. Luke 22, verse 22, where Jesus says, For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. So, As God has said, the Son of Man will die. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. God does it, but we will take the penalty for our sin. Well, just as God could have bypassed the wills of human beings in the execution of his will, but he did not, so could he also have decided to bypass things in the execution of his will. But even so, he did not. For example, as the forces of nature... As for the forces of nature, God could have canceled the seasons. And he could by himself have come and supplied fruit, grain, and vegetables directly to us from his own hand. But he decreed 
that the season should happen and that they should be the cause of other actions like trees that blossom, the blossom that become a fruit, or leaves that turn yellow, red, and brown and then fall off. Is that not why Genesis 8 verse 22 so beautifully places God's faithful steering of events behind all the forces of nature? This is what Genesis 8 verse 22 says. As long as the earth will endure, sea time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. So it is clear. God himself is the first cause behind every action or event taking place in the universe. Now, over the centuries, theologians have looked at the second causes. In other words, all things happening in the world under the sun and all events that also happen in the Bible. And they have come to the conclusion that these second causes always appear in one of three groups. And so the Westminster mentions these three groups of second causes. It mentions them as those which happen necessarily, or those which happen freely, or those which happen contingently. So I will explain, firstly, then those second causes. So we have God as the first cause, but then those second causes which are necessary. My brothers and sisters, second causes which are necessary are, for example, the sun, the moon, and the stars. As long as this world shall last, they are necessary causes for the illumination of our world. And to us human beings, it might seem as if, as if they are the first causes. But no, they are only second causes in the hand of the first cause, God. That's why Jeremiah, through the Holy Spirit, says in Jeremiah 31, verse 35, Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night. God who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. He steers all these things with his power. So the sun, moon, and stars are examples of necessary second causes. That's the first group of second causes. So here is the second group of second causes, and that is all those actions that to us seem to happen freely. That is by man's free choice. For example, the free choice which God gave in his word to someone who had communicated manslaughter. Such a person could choose, or such a person could not choose, to run to one of those free cities which God's law appointed for their safety. And uh, the person could run to such a free city, or he or she could decide not to take up the offer. Yet whatever such a person's choice would be, he or she would be acting as a second cause, for nothing happens without God as first cause steering it. Of course, without God violating the human will in this matter, and without God to be blamed for man's sinful or bad decisions. But that's an example of the second group of second causes, and that means those second causes which to our human perception seem to happen by our free choice. My brother and sister, you and I make hundreds of free choices every day. 
But I will just mention a few of these choices. Yes, some who have great impact on our lives. For example, a young person who has to choose which field he or she will qualify themselves in, or which job they will apply for, or in which town or suburb they should live, or whom, as they think, I should marry. Now, as for this last mentioned example, there's a lot that can be said. For you see, a godly young man and a young woman looking for a wife or a husband can wreck their brains thinking, but how do I know that the person I am now interested in is the one God has decreed that I should marry it or that I should be married to for life? After all, the Bible clearly tells us already before the world began, God has predestined his elect. Yes, God has predestined whom his loved ones would be. Now, if God has predestined those dear people, and they must still be born from me and my wife, then surely it means that God has also decreed, and it is vitally important, whom I should marry, and that I should marry correctly. Well, if a young person before marriage thinks too much in this direction, it can drive him nuts. So my advice to young people who are looking for a husband or wife is the following. Prayerfully seek someone who is a godly person. Somebody who reverences and loves the Lord Jesus. Somebody whose personality is compatible with yours. And granted, every young man would rather like to have an outwardly pretty woman. And every young woman would rather want a handsome young man. But remember, inward beauty, yes, a beautiful and godly character, is more important than outward symmetry of face or arms or muscles. So seek. Yes, seek diligently, seek carefully and prayerfully while knowing that despite our human frailty, God will lead you to the one he has chosen for you. Well, we've just heard the second group of second causes. Those that seem to us as if they just happen by our own free choosing. So here is the third and last group of second causes. And that is those that seem to us to happen contingently or conditionally. To give an example of an event that happens contingently or conditionally, we can now look again at our Old Testament passage, the account of how Micaiah's prophecy was upheld as a truthful word from God. My brother and sister, remember how Micaiah prophesied that King Ahab would die in that battle against the Syrians. King Ahab wouldn't believe that Micaiah's prophecy was from God. So Ahab ordered that poor Micaiah be thrown in prison and that he be given little food until Ahab would return from battle. Well then... Despite the fact that King Ahab deliberately dressed not like a king, but in the clothes of an ordinary soldier to hide himself, the enemy's random arrow still found him. So he was fatally wounded, and he slowly died that same evening. You hope that as Ahab was slowly dying, he repented of his sin, and he turned to the Lord. But we don't know what his thoughts were. But anyhow, what do we see? 
we see that Micaiah's integrity as prophet was dependent on King Ahab's death. Yes, Ahab's death was the contingency or the condition on which God's prophet's integrity would be upheld and vindicated. So a question, who caused Ahab's death? Was it the Syrian enemy? Was it the Syrian enemy's arrow? Ha! The enemy and his arrow, they were only second causes. But who was the first cause? It was God. So see the example of a second cause that happened contingently or conditionally? Here is an example from our lives and our times. Suppose you and I want to buy a house. So we make an offer on that house like the Dyson family has made. Yet in our offer, we put a condition. And we pray over that condition. And what is that condition? Well, that we can only buy that house on condition that our current house first gets sold. And so what do we see? Well, don't we see that we are the ones who decided to make that offer the way we made it? Yet who, often without us even knowing or thinking or acknowledging it, is the first cause behind that decision? Yes, who is the one who will eventually make known in which direction our condition offer will play or fall out? It's God, isn't it? My brother and sister, we've just seen how all second causes fall within uh, three groups. They either happen necessarily like the sun, moon, and stars, or freely like our choices, or contingently. And now I skip about 70 words. And here is another important and very insightful thing. And that is that God can perform and mostly does perform his will through people in such a way that they don't even know or realize that they're actually instruments, that they're actually second causes in the hands of the first cause. Just remember what Isaiah once said about the Assyrian king who thought that he was serving himself when he slaughtered Israel. Yet all the while, he was instrument in God's hands, executing God's will. Remember Isaiah 10, verse 6 and 7, in which we hear God say, and he talks about the Assyrian king. God says, I send him, I send the Assyrian king against my godless nation, I dispatched him against the people who anger me to seize loot and snatch and plunder and to trample them down like mud in the streets. But this is not what he intends. That's not how he sees it. This is not the way he has it in mind. His purpose is simply, I will destroy. I will put an end to many nations. My brother and sister, in the same way, do many people not even realize that when they choose a new job or buy a house or choose someone for a wife or a husband, they're not simply following their own desire, but that they're actually second causes governed by God, the first cause. I come to the last point. God's means can be ordinary or extraordinary. My brother and sister, God does not need to use miracles to execute his plan or his decrees. Of course, God is free to use miracles, also known as the extraordinary means. 
but he can simply use ordinary means, which from our point of view seem to be the ordinary way by which God works. He is an example of God using ordinary means. Remember when, on his way to Rome, the Apostle Paul was in that shipwreck near Malta. Well, it was then that God chose to rescue Paul and all on board in the ordinary way. That is, that they had to all stay on board up to the last minute or they would all have drowned. God could have chosen to perform an extraordinary miracle here. Yes, God had the power to calm that storm or even to lift that ship out of the water and make it fly to Rome. That would be God working without the ordinary means. But God didn't, for it was not within his decreed will. Now, you and I may speculate as to why God allowed for that storm in the first place. And why God then, secondly, why he sent that storm did not miraculously move the whole ship out of the storm. Could it possibly be that God wanted to use Paul's faith amidst that storm to bring others on that ship to faith in Christ? Or could it be that through Paul's conduct and leadership during that disaster, God wanted to work respect for Paul in the heart of the guards who were to hand him over to the Roman police once they arrived in Rome? Could it be that the reason why God is not instantly removing your current hardship is because he is purifying you and those around you for better service? You and I may not know for sure. God does not have to explain his every motive to us. But this we know, that God saved all men on board that ship by using the ordinary means. Just the wind, just its direction, its strength, and then it's calming down. So God can work through the ordinary means. A modern day example of this is when God uses the ordinary doctors, the anti-inflammatory pills, and the chemotherapy to heal people. Yes, God can work through ordinary means. But then again, God can work above ordinary means. He can heal someone despite or even without medical invention. A clear example from the Bible where God, where we see God working above ordinary means is when he stretched the standard limits as he did with Abraham and Sarah, when he stretched the ordinary childbearing age by decades for Abraham to the age of 100. And for Sarah, he stretched it to the age of 90. So see, God can work above ordinary means. But then, of course, God can also work against ordinary means. For example, when in the days of Elisha, God caused an axe head, a heavy metal thing, to float on water. And when he caused Daniel's friends to have no smell of fire on them, and that while, and that, while those who picked them up to throw them into the fire were all burned up to death. That's God working against the natural order of things. And of course, all true miracles, my brother and sister, are proof of God working above or against nature. Well, we come to the end. My brother and sister, based upon the Bible, the Westminster have reminded us that God is the first cause of all events. That God steers all second causes, whether they happen necessarily, freely, or contingently. 
And that God's means can be the ordinary or the extraordinary. But here is the last thing important that you and I should remember that whatever God does and however he does it, it's always done according to his pleasure, his own good pleasure. And with that decision, God's people must learn to be content. For example, as old father Eli was content even when he learned from little Samuel of the disaster what God was going about to bring on him and his sons. Amen.